this is Jamie Court uh, in Santa Monica. Actually, we're not in Santa Monica. I keep doing that. We are now in Carthay Circle. Jamie Court and Carthay Circle. We are now the LA-based group consumer watchdog for anyone listening on the line. It is 11:01, so let me uh, let me promptly get started. If everyone's everyone's ready, Pete's not in anyone's no, shop. Sure. Good. Go. Okay. Great. So I'm Jamie Court. Uh, I'm the president of Consumer Watchdog. With me is Adam Scow, our senior advocate. And the people who aren't here today are maybe the most important. They are 20 whistleblowers, all car industry insiders, engineers, developers, uh, people who work for car companies and their suppliers. They are the ones who supplied this report. But they cannot show their faces because if they did, they'd be fired and their companies would be fired from uh, the supply chain. This report that we're releasing today is critical to American security, it's critical to consumer safety, and it's critical to for Congress to understand it. The report is called Kill Switch, Why Connected Cars Can Be Killing Machines and How to Turn Them Off. What these whistleblowers have done is over the course of five months shown us exactly why the new fleet of 2020 cars are extraordinarily dangerous, can be hacked, and are potentially the biggest national security threat that exists today. And today I'm going to walk you through their findings, not mine, but their findings, and we're going to talk about what can be done to fix this problem and protect the cars on the roads. So let's just get started with the basic premise of the report. The basic premise of the report is this. Connecting safety critical systems to the internet in a car is inherently dangerous. Connecting the brakes, the engine, the steering mechanism of a car to the internet is dangerous because cars can be hacked, cars are computers. Best case scenario for security practiced by the aviation industry, practiced by the military industrial complex, practiced by Wall Street investment firms is keep your computers off the internet. Yet America's car makers are about to put an entire fleet of cars, tens of millions of cars on the road that are connected to the internet without proper security. I've been doing this for 30 years, and this is the most frightening issue that I've ever worked on. What we are presenting today isn't just the possibility of a single hack or an errant hack. It is the danger of a fleet-wide hack. The danger is that a hacker, potentially working for a hostile government, hacks a fleet of cars when hundreds of thousands of them are on the road, depletes the brakes in all of them steers the cars off the road, and there's chaos and people die. We are talking about the possibility of a 9-11 scale attack on America. Mm -hmm. And the car makers, remarkably, know it but haven't fixed it. And that is why these whistleblowers came forward. So let me break it down for you. Top selling car models, this is all from the report. By 2020, the biggest three car makers, including General Motors, Toyota, Ford, are going to have all their cars connected to the internet. Every single car. Yet, the safety they, systems they use are all internet connected systems, many of them, for some of these makers, based on open source software. These are the names of the systems and they are vulnerable because they connect to the internet. These are not private, uh, private connections. The main technical information I'm going to give you today, and this is all the technical information I'm going to give you today, is this is a Toyota diagram of what we call the CAN bus. The CAN bus connects the safety critical systems of the car okay, throughout the car. And the antenna on the Toyota connects to the internet. And as you can see, the telematics unit, remember that word telematics, because this is actually a term that the insurance commissioner of California recently used in wanting to give insurance companies access to the CAN bus, telematics, is connected to the antenna. Which means if someone comes in through the cellular network, if they bust the security, they have access to the entire car. And it has happened. 
It's happened only by white hat hackers. These are people who are generally uh, trying to show the companies they've done something wrong and help them fix it. We have yet to see the devastation when a malicious hacker takes control of a car, takes control of the CAN bucks, takes control of the telematics unit. Now, I'm pausing for a second on telematics because Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara last Thursday was at a closed door meeting of insurance company executives in Hollywood on video caught, uh, obtained by Politico. And he said that he wants to give the insurance companies the ability to access our telematics units so they know how we brake, how often we brake, when we accelerate, we know how we drive. He said on tape, that's going to make us drive safer. No, that is going to open us up to hacks that will kill us. And Insurance Commissioner Lara hopefully will be educated by this report, as will all the elected officials. But I've got to say, with hundreds of insurance industry lawyers at a closed door meeting where only a video camera recorded, you see how insidious this is. The companies have long wanted to get access to the telematics of a car. Long wanted to do it because they don't want to insure people who accelerate too quick. They want to know all this information so they can sell the information. So Commissioner Lara was particularly ignorant about the California Consumer Privacy Act. When asked about it, he didn't know what it was, even though he voted on it as a senator. That actually protects our, our private information from being sold against our will. Nothing protects our lives from being toyed with when the car companies get access, give access to the insurance companies because they have to go under the law to this type of info. Now this is the basic schematic from the report that explains the idea that the antenna gets from a 3G, 5G, 4G Wi-Fi network and the CAN bus connects to the car and the hacking that has always been done on record is always through that CAN bus. And hackers tell us it's just a matter of money to break into that system. Could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, it could be millions, but you know what, a hostile government has that kind of money. I'm gonna go quickly through some of the rest of the report, but I want you to just know, one of the big dangers is that we are using open source software developed on smartphones for these car security systems. That was what I was showing you a little earlier about those systems. The same security used in my smartphone is what's being used in a car. Literally, the Android system is being used by Fiat Chrysler, Volvo, Renault, ni Nissan, the Linux operating systems in a Tesla. And, the, and the, guy who the guy who wrote the Linux operating system, Linus Torvald, said when asked, aren't you going to feel bad if they break in through Linux, an open source system, to a nuclear power plant and they hack it and people die? He says, no, because it's insane to connect the Linux operating system to a nuclear power plant. Well, it's insane to connect the Linux operating system to a car because, and to hundreds of thousands of cars that can be as dangerous as a power plant. We are not planning for this in terms of national security. We also know from the car makers themselves that there have been literally hundreds of vulnerabilities in their software. Because it's not being written securely, it's being written by the same people who make software for the iPhones. This is coming from the whistleblowers themselves who know the supply chain. And that's what really scares them. Car companies pay uh, for hundreds of vulnerabilities, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. Well, what happens if one of those vulnerabilities is discovered and no one wants to go to the car company? Instead, they exploit it. That is what we're painting a picture of in this report. And I'll show you how this fleet wide hack can happen. There could be a direct attack, as there was on the cheap Jer 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 Cherokee by, uh, by uh, two hackers who have become notorious for this hack and the company patched the problem. So it could go right over a Wi-Fi network, but there also could be vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle worms. One vehicle spreading to another vehicle malware for a malicious attack. There also could be a home base attack. Someone gets into the gateway system for GM and they infect the entire fleet. Often a virus might be put in the car for want of a better word or in the software and that will then be activated later, possibly, by a hotspot. So you infect the cars, and then when it comes rush hour, someone hits the key. And that's how a Wi-Fi hotspot might work. You have malware in a car, a Wi-Fi, because it connects to that CAN bus, can activate it. And what you'll have is a huge traffic jam on the 405, and not only deaths and destruction, 
but the lack and slow down and closing of our infrastructure in America. Our transportation infrastructure will literally shut down if we have a fleet-wide hack. Let me explain to you what these guys have. Also, they've, they've talked, by the way, about how there's so many suppliers to these car manufacturers, many of them foreign, that we don't even know, and they don't even know what's in their own car. Military uh, contractors go through security checks. Car maker contractors don't, so viruses could be planted, bugs could be planted on the supply chain without the car companies even knowing. And of course, a digital application attack is really one of the most likely because car, car companies are selling connected cars on the basis that you can turn your car on with your cell phone and get the air conditioning running on a hot day. Well, if you can turn your car on and get the air conditioning running with your smartphone, someone else can access your smartphone and shut your car down in the middle of the highway at rush hour. Mobile to mobile device attacks are another possibility. And this is the real scary part. These are the casualties. We know uh, there are 19 million vehicles on the road at rush hour. At any one time, we could have 3.75 million vehicles, one of the main car company fleets, attacked. Drivers of infected cars would be on the road at rush hour in the, about two or 300,000 number. The projected injuries, if you had 262,000 people on the road and someone cut their brakes, is about 134,000 people. The projected deaths is about 3,000. And what you have to remember, if you're on the road driving a car, someone cuts your brakes, maybe you survive, but maybe not the person in the next car or the pedestrian on the road or the bicycle looks next to you. We're all interconnected on the roads. So this is why we worry about 9-11 type disasters because the numbers bear it out. If a fleet white hack is accomplished, we will see thousands of people die and we will not know what to do the day after. What happened after 9-11? No air travel. No air travel for more than a week. How would we drive if our cars are connected to the internet and the automakers aren't shutting them off? Well, that's why the title of the report is called Kill Switch. The proposal in this report that Congress and the legislature and everyone should really adopt is we should be putting very cheap 50 cent kill switches in all of these cars between the infotainment system where you might want uh, cellular access and the CAN bus and you should be able to turn it off if you're worried about it being connected and your car should be able to work and you should be able to turn it off in the aftermath of a national disaster. Now the aftermath of a national disaster will look something like the cover of this report with cars backed up. We've got to get America driving again. This does not solve the problem, however, of what we do to fix this. The only way to fix this, according to the car industry technologists, is this, and you'll hear from one of them in a second. You've got to disconnect the safety critical systems, the CAN bus, from the cellular unit. There cannot be a wire, there cannot be a connection that can be hacked. It's got to be disconnected. Car designs take three to five years, so this is going to be a long-term solution. The car makers have to start now. Congress has to make them if they won't do it now. And we also need to have safety certifications for every supplier. We need to have safety certifications for all the software. We need to treat this as critical infrastructure. Because, believe me, there are a lot of nations, like Russia, like Iran, that are declaring cyber war in America. And this is the most vulnerable infrastructure, and it's right under the nose of the car makers. They know, but they haven't told us. And, I'm, and so what is the response of the car makers to the report? I'm going to turn it over for a second before we hear from the whistleblowers to Adam Scow to tell us, because believe it or not, the car makers haven't told the public about any of these dangers, or the regulators as far as we know, but they've told their investors, because they don't want to be sued. Adam? Thank you, Jamie. I'll be very brief. Um, we looked at some of the financial statements and annual reports of some of the top car makers, and as Jamie mentioned, here is what they are saying. Uh, and Tesla's uh, this year, in their 10K to the SEC, there can be no assurance that vulnerabilities will not be exploited in the future because they can be identified, or that our remediation efforts are or will be successful. Daimler Chrysler, uh, at the end. The previous year, the information technology risks have increased compared with the previous year from medium to high. Ford, now this is a pretty juicy one, um, and I really want to hone in on this. A cyber incident could be caused by malicious third parties using sophisticated, targeted methods to circumvent firewalls, encryption, 
and other security defenses, including hacking, fraud, trickery, or other forms of deception. We, our suppliers, and our dealers have been the target of these types of attacks in the past, and such attacks are likely to occur in the future. The techniques used for attacks by third parties change frequently and may become more sophisticated, which may cause cyber uh, incidents to be difficult to detect for long periods of time. Couldn't say any, any better than so. Thank you, Ford. General Motors similarly uh, highlighting a similar uh, threat. So the biggest car companies in the world, in this country, know that this is a problem. And again, uh, if you look at a timeline in the report, we have a timeline of all the hacks. This problem has been going on for over five years. One would think the, pr the threat is lessening because the car companies are addressing them. But these statements show that the threat is only getting worse. And more and more of these new cars are being placed on the internet. Uh, so this is very concerning. The car companies know the risks but they are proceeding anyways. So I'll turn it back over to Jamie. Let me play a video for you, I'll play a couple of videos for you. I know there's a lot here. I do want to just focus on one thing though. As far as I know, no one has ever <laughs> reported or heard in the public sphere that Ford has been the subject of a malicious hack. I've never seen it. Uh, in our research, we haven't seen it. And yet Ford is burying in its disclosure to the Securities Exchange Commission that it and its suppliers have been the subject of malicious hacks. So we know malicious hacks have happened. We're just not hearing about it. And that's a real important reason for these whistleblowers to have come forward, but it's also a really important reason for Congress and the legislature to mandate that the public and regulators know about every malicious hack. They don't today. Let me play for you um, just a very brief hacking video. There's lots of this. The first video here, these are uh, the two Jeep hackers, but after this, you're going to see Chinese hackers take over a Tesla. And these same Chinese hackers at Teen Labs who took over the Tesla are presenting in Vegas uh, at a conference in a week. And they're going to talk about how they took over a BMW. These are Chinese hackers. Now, our trade war with China is heating up. And I'm, these, these are white-eyed hackers. They're good people who are trying to show the company what they've done wrong. But one could easily see how foreign nations would invest in these types of companies to do this type of hacking. So let me play this, it's about, only about two and a half minutes. They're, they're putting uh, so much Oh, that's out. the wrong one, sorry. Uh, that was the whistleblower one. This is the, this is the, we'll go for the whistleblower. This is on the internet, by the way. Our videos. So this is, uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Vasilek. Let's get started. All right, let's drive. Valasek, sorry, Chris Valasek and Charlie Miller. Yeah, you ready? Yeah. Well, how fast are you going? 30. All right, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a known hack. This is Key Labs from China, and it's subtitled. This is manipulating the brake system 12 miles away. Okay, okay. 
，好好，我们一会儿你听我喊到刹车之后，你就你就去执行刹车的命令，好不好？好的，好，嗯，那我们开始啊，好，好，我脚放开了啊，脚从刹车上放开了，好，好，车开始动了。油门，油门加一点啊，加一点油门。好的。你把脚拿开，我把脚拿开。OK， 好。你脚往外，再往外面放一点，好不好？好，上车。OK。我靠！我靠！好，我靠！搞定了。好。好Chinese ha hackers can take over a Tesla today. Um, Iranian hackers can take over a fleet of Teslas tomorrow. Uh, this is real national security stuff, which is why I'm going to play for you the testimony of one of these whistleblowers who talked to us in silhouette the other day, so you can listen uh, for a few minutes to what he has to say. They're, they're putting uh, so much. Let me see if I can start it over. They're, they're putting uh, so much technology into cars nowadays. You can control all sorts of aspects of your car from your smartphone, including starting the engine, starting the air conditioning, uh, checking on its location. Well, if you can do it with your smartphone, anybody else can. Um, over, over the internet, a lot of the technology that is being adopted into cars, they're being treated like any other mobile device, like a cell phone or a tablet. And in fact, uh, popular operating systems that are being used in cars nowadays are developed by uh, BlackBerry or uh, Android, for example. Uh, which is, you know, the, the most popular uh, smartphone operating system on the planet, is uh, now extending its reach into cars. The problem is that the purpose of cell phone technology is to be flexible, to be adaptable, to have new features all the time. It was never designed to keep people safe. But the difference between hacking into somebody's smartphone and stealing their credit card number and hacking into somebody's car is that cars kill people. A car is, you know, two and a half tons of, of metal hurtling down the, the road at 65 miles per hour with your kids strapped into the back seat. Um, you know, that's not something that you want anybody other than the driver of the vehicle to have control over. You know, take General Motors, for example, they sold three million cars last year in the United States. And if every one of those cars is connected to the internet and every one of those cars is running the same software, you find a vulnerability in one of those uh, cars, you've, you've found a vulnerability in the entire fleet. Somebody could potentially hack all three million of those cars. And uh, then you've got a, a major disaster on your hands. The reason we're concerned about this right now is that at present, there are about 50 million connected vehicles on the roads today in the, in the U.S., but that number is growing very, very rapidly, particularly uh, starting this year when it will become nearly impossible to purchase a new car that does not have an internet connection. What I would advocate uh, is that the safety critical systems within the car need to be completely separated. Uh, the term is air adapt from the parts that are connected to the internet. You can have most of the features that you want, uh, but uh, it just needs to be done in a safe way and the auto industry is not doing that. Now with this kind of technology with, with uh, fleets full of connected cars on the road, this, the same kind of damage can be done, but it can be done without terrorists or uh, invaders having put their feet on U.S. soil. And uh, it can be done from, from anywhere in the world and for a fraction of the price. Well, it's hard to say. I mean, you can use the uh, bug bounties that car companies pay out to white out hackers as sort of a, uh, an, an estimate of the, uh, the, the market cost of uh, one of these hacks. Uh, Tesla right now I think is, is paying the, the highest bug bounty in the industry of uh, $15,000 for a critical vulnerability in a car. Um, even if it takes several of these strung together to take control of a car, and even if uh, you charge uh, some sort of a premium if you're uh, selling this vulnerability to a uh, uh, hacking organization, I mean, it could still be done for, you know, easily under half a million dollars, and this is chump change. If you're talking about Vladimir Putin, if you're talking about Kim Jong Un, if you're talking about uh, any foreign power, or even most terrorist groups. But if you look at the case of the 2015 
uh, GCAT with, with uh, Charlie Miller and Chris Balasek. They hacked in through the radio, which was internet connected, and from there were able to get uh, connection onto the car's uh, CAN bus, which is kind of like the central nervous system of the car that controls everything else. And from there, they were able to do all these other things, deactivate the brakes, kill the engine, that sort of thing. What Fiat Chrysler Motors, Jeep's parent company, did in response to that is they plugged the hole in the radio that the hackers used to get in. What they did not do was disconnect the radio from the rest of the car, which is a very simple thing to do. Uh, it's, this, this does not require uh, any kind of sophisticated technology, and that would have prevented not just that problem from happening again. So the short-term solution that we'd like to see is to uh, install a, a kill switch in the car. Now, this is something very simple. This is 19th century technology, just, just a little mechanical switch. Uh, it doesn't cost very much, maybe about 50 cents per car. And uh, what this does is disconnect the internet-connected parts of the car from the safety-critical parts of the car, the parts of the car that control the motion of the vehicle. Um, if you do that, this is not going to stop anybody from hacking your car, but what this will do is, in the wake of some sort of a major uh, incident, uh, some sort of a fleet-wide hack, it will give us a way to restore our confidence in our cars and know that they cannot be hacked again. Uh, you just flip the switch into the safe position and uh, everything's fine. The auto industry has been working hard to try to make cars safe for a long time, and it just hasn't been effective. We are no safer now than we were before. What does it mean that the internet is connected to safety critical systems in a car if a malicious hacker gets access to those safety critical systems? Well, the safety critical systems in a car are, you know, they're, they're all electronic, and you connect them up to the internet. The uh, hacker can control the brakes, can, you know, cause them to activate, cause them not to work at all. Uh, the hacker can control the steering, the hacker can control the acceleration, the hacker can blow the airbags in your face. You know, if the flaw that the hacker exploited in your car is uh, the, the same flaw that's in three million other cars, you know, now you've got a fleet-wide hack, now you've got this happening simultaneously to cars uh, across the country. You've got major gridlock, you've got uh, an excuse for us to uh, go to war, clamp down on civil liberties, all sorts of awful consequences, everything we saw after 9-11 only worse. Well, so the, the problem with open source software is that it has, um, you know, oftentimes literally thousands of different authors from all over the world, and there's no accountability for the quality of it. You can't go back to the original author necessarily and say, you know, hey, does, does this thing actually work the way it's supposed to, or can you help us fix this bug? Um, it's great for doing, uh, you know, rapid development of things. It's, it's uh, great for making a very flexible platform, but it's not something that you want to put your, your life on the line for. Okay, so uh, we'll take questions in a second. I just want to address one issue that uh, maybe is a little nuanced. They're, they're putting... Uh, let me uh, they're, get they're this thing and go backwards if I can to the first slide. Why, why are car companies not addressing this problem? Why are car companies not wanting to do a, a kill switch? The kill switch is 50 cents. This isn't just about money. Uh, it's not that it's going to cost more or a lot more to create security, which is what you would think. But the car companies believe they're going to make more money by following you around through this type of tracking of telematics. They're going to make money off the data. In fact, uh, some of the car companies have already tried to sell that data. They also believe that it's a selling point to tell you that you can do all sorts of cool things with your car from your smartphone and maybe they will sell more cars. So this is a marketing issue for them. It is potentially a data mining issue for them. But the cost of security, which is what I found amazing, of creating greater security is not really any different than what they're doing now because all they have to do is design the cars to have an air gap between the CAN bus and the infotainment system with nobody touching it. 
And the, and the kill switch itself, again, the, the guesstimate is 50 cents. It could be a lot less. These are not, this is not about the car companies having to spend too much money making this car secure. This is about the car companies wanting to make more money because they're following us around and they can use that data in all sorts of ways. The surveillance capitalism is what it's called. But also it's about the car companies wanting to have something they could market that's sexy and new. Uh, and this remote control aspect of, of being able to tap into your car through the cell phone and the smartphone is what they are selling. What they're not telling you is what they are telling investors. That's fatal. That can be fatal. The cost of that convenience, the cost of starting your car from your cell phone could be one day that your child is subject of a hack and has to drive off the road when the car's beyond their control. That's not acceptable. And the reason these really brave people came forward is because they wanted to make sure that didn't happen to their children or your children or our children. And so we really hope it, that every legislator who reads this report in Washington or in California seizes on it. <coughs> We're expecting that the California Insurance Commissioner will read the report, or at least the summary, <coughs> and understand what's going on. Because behind closed doors, just a matter of days ago, he promised to engage the insurance industry in creating telematic links to our cars that will allow insurance companies to tap in to what we're doing with our braking and accelerating. This is dangerous. It will kill people one day if we don't stop it now. And there's no public official for either party that should be engaged in accelerating this trend. They should put a stop to it now if they care about the lives of their constituents and the, and, and the health of this country. So yeah, any questions you have? Who, uh, on a federal level, who do you think would have jurisdiction to impose these kind of changes? Would it be the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration? Would well, it be NHTSA, the Department of Transportation? NHTSA would be the one. Well, there's two. There could be the, the National NHTSA, the National uh, Traffic Highway Safety Administration, should get reports when there are malicious hacks. They really should. But if they have, they haven't told the public about it or addressed it. I doubt that Ford actually disclosed this to them because it's, it could potentially be something that would be the subject of a recall, which would be. What's the fact? But, but, all, but also, let me just, in Congress, uh, there are, this is both the national intelligence issues and the national intelligence committees, and also Senators uh, Markey uh, and Blumenthal have recently in, in, introduced some legislation to take on cybersecurity issues. It does not yet deal with the kill switch or these issues, but we are going to ask them to engage with this and go to them and say, why not put this kill switch in and get the companies to report back and certify the technology and tell us what they're doing to build this air gap. So it's really the job of Congress. I doubt the uh, Trump administration would do it, but honestly, the Department of Motor Vehicles, if they felt that there was a threat to the roads in California, would have some jurisdiction. And the governor of California should care about what happens on our roads. If you, uh, there was already a report that some, some legislators in Sacramento got their hands on the report and they are considering working with us on some legislation. So I think we're going to have a more friendly environment in Sacramento to enacting something than we are in um, Washington, D.C. Any particular lawmakers that you know that are already on board with you guys on this? Well, I only talked one to one lawmaker, uh, but Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, who is the chair of the Judiciary Committee, did tell Politico that she was very concerned about this and we are going to meet next week to talk about legislation or some possible response. So she hasn't committed to anything, but just on the news of what she heard about this report, on the heels of the news about the insurance industry trying to ram this down our throats concerned her. I'm sorry, go back to Randy. Yeah. Um, without re revealing his identity, what are the qualifications background of your hack, of your uh, syllabus? Yeah, and, and to say that the, 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 uh, the whistleblower is a spokesperson for the group, he's uh, got more than two decades of experience in software engineering. Uh, he works uh, on software uh, that goes into cars and actually into other things, but mostly cars. Uh, and he was chosen because he's obviously eloquent. But online at consumerwatchdog.org, where our press release lives, there is a longer version of that video. We had a 27 minute conversation with him that's fascinating from start to end. But the 20, if you, you want to hear about the insurance aspect, because this just broke when we were interviewing him. Uh, at 23 minutes, you can look just to the question of telematics and insurance. Everything else is about the, the car manufacturers, and that's all online. And he's, he's also, um, uh, you know, he's, he doesn't work directly for a car company, but he works in the supply chain for a company, and he says that he is very concerned about his employer firing him uh, and his um, 
uh, his colleagues even being fired if anyone learns about his uh, identity. What are the general backgrounds of the other 19? They're all engineers, uh, generally. There are some others who are not engineers who are general technologists, but, but the people who contributed to this report are software engineers by and large. Some of them are involved in the hardware aspect, and some of them are a little bit more general, uh, generalists uh, uh, with some profiles. And actually, one or two of them may actually come forward, uh, you know, in the future if there's congressional testimony. We'll Jamie, in theory, there shouldn't be any kind of major delay in putting an air gap between the CAN bus and the internet system on these cars at all. I like how Pete thinks, but he doesn't think like the uh, the car makers. Excuse me. <laughs> When it came to exploding frigging airbags, the government put down an order and Detroit jumped because they realized they were going to do it or get not shut true. down. Yeah. Well, the, the, that, was not, that was not an idle threat. No, that's true. And, and if the government asked, it, it, it could speed up. But what the, car, what the engineers tell us, and again, they're engineers, is that car designs are three to five years in the future. The quickest you could possibly even get a kill switch into a car, they say, is one to two years. Maybe an air gap in two to three years if Congress made them do it. But the point being, um, these companies don't turn on a dime and it is going to take some federal intervention or it's going to take a mass, uh, unfortunately, attack to wake us up to this. I mean, this is a, a warning. This is an early warning call. And I don't think if you haul any of the company CEOs before Congress to testify under oath, they'll dispute a single word in this report. I, I don't think there's a single word in this report that can be disputed. These engineers are very careful. Uh, this is all public record. The only question is whether they're going to fix it before the worst happens. Are you solely advocating for a kill switch, or are you also lobbying for cars not to be connected at all? Good point. We are lobbying for cars not to be connected at all, uh, and that is in the report. In the front and the back, we have the recommendations. We think there needs to be an air gap. We also think there's some other measures, like safety certifications of everybody in the supply chain, safety certifications of the software. We need to put military industrial type security into the supply chain and into the systems that are used by the car industry. And, and in fact, the aviation industry already implements these. Uh, the, if you go on, a, on a, you know, can't get, you can't hack into a plane from a, from <laughs> from a mobile from a, from an air uh, Wi-Fi or any Wi-Fi. You just can't. So the safety critical systems are disconnected. We are advocating for a disconnect of the safety critical systems from the internet, plain and simple. But until we get there because that will take some design, and this is based on what the engineers tell us, they believe it can't be done quickly. The quickest thing is this proposed kill switch. It still takes time, but at least it's quick. And the other thing I would say is we are advocating for the legislature and the governor to quickly make clear to the insurance industry and the insurance commissioner it is not acceptable to let the insurance companies have access through the internet to safety critical systems in the car. And that uh, has to happen now. That can be done in Sacramento, and that has to be done not just to stop the insurance industry, but unless he's changed his tune in the last four days, our insurance commissioner, who was in the middle of a scandal for taking money from insurance companies when he said he wasn't going to, he gave the money back, but then he was caught intervening on behalf of donors, uh, in overruling some of the cases that judges in his department made on the workers' comp side. There is a pet insurance kingpin's wife who gave him money, and he is now uh, involved in a bill to help the pet insurance industry. We hope the governor will veto. I mean, so we, this, this insurance commissioner uh, has proven that he went to the insurance companies and said, I want to give you what my department would not give you before, the ability to track people in your cars. And there's a very powerful quote where he says, if you're being watched, uh, if, if they know when, when you're braking and when you're speeding, you'll drive safer. That is insane. And, and, and that level of insanity has to stop now before it gets started. We are not going to let the insurance industry do this in California anymore, and we're going to let the car industry do it nationally. But, we, we, but the, the, the good news is the insurance industry is banned from doing it in California now, thanks to all of our previous insurance commissioners who wouldn't even let them keep track electronically of the miles driven because they knew there was a privacy danger, and now we're adding a security danger. It, it, it seems as though, though your request for... Let that go. Uh, being air gapped or even you know no internet connectivity whatsoever, whatsoever would mean no driverless future. No, uh, the driverless cars. Um, well, first of all, if you've been following our work, we've been very critical of how quickly a self-driving um, future exists. Okay, but uh, self-driving cars. Uh, 
have, are, are unable to keep up with human beings for lots of reasons, and we've done multiple reports on why they're not ready for the roads. However, they operate uh, not over Wi-Fi networks um, in the best case scenario. Uh, they operate on LiDAR, video, they're self-contained, they're actually designed to shut down themselves when there are no connections, because if you think about it, you're in a rural area, you don't have a cell phone connection. Sometimes they operate connected to a satellite. So self-driving cars actually are not, this is a very good point, as big a threat as self-driving cars are, in our view, uh, because they're not reliable and they can kill people, the cars on the road today are a bigger threat because they're internet connected and they can be hacked. More people will die on a fleet-wide hack than if there's a software bug in a self-driving car. So self-driving cars have not been necessarily developed that way. They're being developed many ways. But the Google cars, which, I have, uh, which are the farthest advanced in the market, the Waymo cars, they call them now, are actually designed not to be connected, to shut down and pull over to the side of the road if there's a problem. Now, they also have lots of problems. But one of the reasons that these whistleblowers came to us is because we've been such a high-profile critic of self-driving cars. Honestly, after looking at this, I'm much more fearful of the cars coming in 2020 than the cars that are self-driving that are coming in 2026. And just real quick, did any of those whistleblowers actually work for an auto manufacturer, or were they yes. all kind of ancillary? No, okay. no, they all work directly for manufacturers or through the supply chain, one or the other. I mean, the well, most you got to remember, most auto the manufacturer software comes through a supply chain, which is what's dangerous. They don't write their own software generally. And that's what's dangerous, because some of the supply chain is in places that you can't guarantee the security of the supply. Don't the public disclosures make the automakers <coughs> at greater risk because they're letting everybody know that they're aware of the dangers, they're aware of the problem with their systems, and they aren't saying that they fix them? Uh, they're saying, and in fact they said to, in response to today's report, I saw one quote already, is saying, we acknowledge this is a risk and we all have to work on it together. Why work on it together? Why don't you design the cars so they're not at risk? It doesn't cost you anymore. Uh, that's just... So, but they, the reason that they disclosed it is not out of the goodness of their heart in their annual reports in the Securities Exchange Fund. Yeah, they want when the, there's, a, there's a big attack and the shareholders sue them because the stock plummets, we told you so. But if they're being honest with the shareholders, they should be honest with the public and the lawmakers, which is why we think all these car makers, CEOs, have to go to Congress and answer direct questions from the lawmakers themselves. We're anticipating the car And in fact, by the way, John Garamendi, I forgot, is the head of the... Uh, National, one of the National Intelligence Committees, and he is a former insurance commissioner from California who would never let this happen. So um, I guess I'll put him on my call list. I mean, I just to, to think about it, he is the senior member of the uh, House Intelligence Committee, I think. Anticipating that the manufacturers will say that they are fully aware of this threat, that they have uh, very intense procedures uh, and software in place to deal with it, you would say. Well, what the whistleblowers say is there's no way to stop a malicious hack if you create a, a, a wide area network access, internet access, to the safety critical systems. It's just a matter of how much it's going to cost to infiltrate those systems. If you spend hundreds of thousands, they believe it can be done on a consistent basis. If you spend millions, it could probably be done on a fleet-wide basis, regardless of what security you put in. Remember, the people we talk to are people who do what's called defense. They're not hackers. But if you ask the hackers in Vegas next week, they'll tell you, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hack this car for a pizza. I mean, you know, the, 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 it doesn't matter to them. The, the, it's a challenge. But when you put up $100,000, then you can get a Tesla and play with it. You put up millions of dollars, you can play with it more. It's just a matter of will and time. And there really hasn't been the same motive for a malicious hack as we've seen to date. But also, there hasn't been the potential for a fleet-wide hack. The big warning call here is we are going to have tens of millions of cars connected to the Internet, and all the new car models are not going to have any way to shut that connection off. And so it's going to be much easier for a malicious hacker to cause a lot of damage if they want to. And we better be prepared. And the car companies are acknowledging they are not prepared. The only way to be prepared is to not have the connection. That's the only way to be prepared. According to the engineers, uh, uniformly, no disagreement. There can't be that connection. Now, there's reasons also the car makers want that connection. Um, they want to do over-the-air updates to their software rather than have to bring the vehicles in and fix them. However, you could do a secure over-the-air update if you wanted to, if you controlled security for over the air, and it wasn't always over the air, 
and maybe you disconnected the connection between the CAN bus and that, and that update when it wasn't being updated. Tesla updates its cars while you're driving them and doesn't tell you. Literally, after it's the software. It's, it's, so these car companies want to do it cheap that way. They want to be able to tie into your car and just maintain it without having to bring you into a mechanic and have you come into a shop. There is some convenience loss there for them. But outside of that, uh, the costs really are of this lost future business, not so much um, the, the, the cost of the security in any way. Just one more quick question for me. Um, right now, vehicles on the road, including the one I drove here today, driving, a lot of us have, is a connection between, through the Bluetooth portal, between an internet connection, no. which your phone access yeah. is correct. Then the newer cars that are coming out will have the option of directly connecting. They're not an option, unfortunately. Okay. The new so cars don't have an option. option but, but you would be paying a cell phone provider and you would no. have the car always connected. Well, well, my, my, yeah. my question is, yeah. are the cars that exist right now uh, that are using yeah. Bluetooth connections as vulnerable as the cars that would It's have not the Bluetooth connected? connection that is a vulnerability because your Bluetooth is simply connecting to an infotainment or a head right. unit. But if, it's, but if your Bluetooth is connecting to Apple Music or something. That, that's OK. And you could do it in the future. See, the difference is there is a head unit or an infotainment unit we don't show in this diagram. It, it, and the cellular connection to that infotainment unit is perfectly safe if there's no connection between the infotainment unit and the CAN bus. I see. And so, all we're advocating is that there not be a wire, a connection to the CAN bus, and there's no way for the infotainment unit to talk to the CAN bus. So the infotainment unit, this, the head unit, can talk all it wants, and you can talk all you want on your cell phone, but what can happen is the safety critical systems have any wire, and it's not even an obvious wire. And, and many companies say, we're going to do encrypted software between the CAN bus. Once you establish the, the, the connection, you create an incentive for someone to break through okay. it. Why even have that connection? So to be similar? clear, in, in other words, oh, well, let, let, let her go. Thanks. Just, you know. Thanks. <laughs> a similar question: um, Is there a difference between the cars that are already connected and out there, in terms of your safety concerns, and the cars that are in the supply chain right now? Uh, well, just that there are more coming in 2020. This fall. You're going to be hard pressed if you buy a new one of the big model cars, uh, if, especially if you buy it from General Motors or any of Toyota. You will not be able to buy a car without an internet connection. You will not be able to turn that internet connection off, and you may or not, may not even see that internet connection. That is the car company's way of communicating to the software and making everything a computer and electronic, which in many ways is cheaper for them to maintain. Uh, but you won't even know it. But you won't be able to stop it if something goes wrong. There are just fewer cars. There are cars on the road now that are internet connected. Well, quite a bit of them from 2019. But the whole fleet for the top three automakers is going to be connected uh, in, this in 2020. And that's why we're sending this warning signal, the potential for a lot more damage. And also, when you do a whole fleet, the software becomes standard. So if you find a, a bug uh, and, you don't, and you want to be malicious, you can apply it to every car that has that. So if, or if you break into the gateway system for General Motors, and you put in a virus, uh, that'll infect every General Motors car that's connected. So that's what's so dangerous. The, the threat grows, but it's there today. Yeah, it's really, and, and, and there is no way to shut it off today either. By limiting the internet access to the entertainment system, it would still allow one to have, for example, Google Maps or absolutely you know, everything else yeah. like that. It just, you're talking about here the idea of internet access. Pardon me. You drive the car, yes. Not the damn computer. That's correct, and, and that's well, that's about as simple as it gets. Yes, and, and and the problem is, even when you get past the CAN bus, so many, so much of the car has become electronic and computerized. We're not going backwards on that, but what we can do is make sure it's not connected to a wide area network that can be hacked. The wider the network, the easier the hacking. Yep. All right, you. thank you all. Thank when you. did the whistleblower start coming Good. forward? We uh, heard from um, some folks last fall. We started working with them late fall. So basically, it's been a six-month process. Year, What's that? About a six-month. Yeah, it's been six months. I say five months in the report, but it took us a month to get it out. So yeah, six months. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have more of a comfortable dig next time you show. <laughs> and, and a malt board. Yeah, I'm used to sitting on the floor. We'll throw this to the new director of national intelligence or something like this. And Dan Coates is no, no, replacing no, no. the man I being replaced. I know. But you go and get, uh, get this, this um, 
good old boy from Texas who believes in kicking ass and